Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Brian Leo Malley is the guest of honor today in the in the in the Kayfabe compound. Jimmy, rattle off a little of that bibliography, man. We're gonna launch right into things. Yeah, Lost at Sea, one of his first uh, graphic novels. Seconds, uh, a relatively recent graphic novel of Brian's, Snot Girl from Image Comics. I'm kind of excited to get into some of these very different formats and publishers but of course the reason we know brian leo malley is scott pilgrim the uh the epic if you will something of a game changer in the way comics i think are made and some of the influences that were in scott pilgrim and of course goes on to be a, a fantastic movie adaptation uh not from the corporate owned superheroes but rather creator owned books so a pretty awesome resume there brian uh welcome to cartoonist kayfabe thanks guys <clears throat> um I hope, I hope the technical stuff is working out, the audio, et cetera, but um, it's awesome to be here. Love you guys. You sound you sound fantastic, uh, Brian. Now, we are uh, huge fans and devotees of Naoki Arasawa's Man Ben, and uh, I've never been jealous of another cartoonist for anything, man, until I saw some photos you posted with the man himself out there in Glittertown, oh, out yeah. there in L.A. What was the circumstances of that? Uh, were you able to communicate with him in, in any way? Like, uh, whatever light you can shine on that meeting, uh, please drop some science. I think I have a photo. Oh, yeah, I do. I have a photo of it above my desk. Um, I'm trying to remember. Uh, it was, like, kind of last minute. He was in town. He There's a... Uh, it's called Japan House. There's this thing in L.A a lot of Japanese people in LA so I guess he was doing like kind of a little tour and um, and he, he comes through and he does this thing where he he'll play music he'll be playing songs on his guitar and he has like a loop pedal and he'll he'll loop something and then he'll go draw for 15 20 minutes and like he'll draw something to the song that he was playing and um, so I guess this is something he's been doing in Japan like he'll do like a monthly uh, kind of informal get together but anyway so we did one in LA and I just happened to know someone who knew someone who was in the event and they're like you guys got to come down and meet Naoki Urasawa so me and Leslie Hung uh, the artist of Snot Girl obviously were huge huge Urasawa heads and um, you know we jumped at the opportunity um, the, but ironically like I uh, we were showing him Snot Girl because that was what I think Snot Girl volume 2 maybe had just come out or something and um so he was like all about Leslie, like Leslie's like the artist and I was just like the guy who writes the comic. Like, I mean, it was hard to explain that I also do my own shit, but, um, you know, that, that's fine. I love, I love supporting, um, Leslie, my, my co-creator. Um, but yeah, so, so Ursula thinks Leslie is this amazing artist and doesn't know who the fuck I am. How, <laughs> how the hell does Naoki Urasawa, who has presumably a weekly or let's say maybe bi-weekly deadline on manga created dozens probably getting close to a hundred volumes of manga and he just has time to once a month go to the little coffee house play some music and draw to it where do these guys find the energy that that's like that's a secret i try to unlock when i check out man ben never find the answer i went to japan and hung out with mangaka tried to find the answer there's no answer it's just you sit down and you fucking make comics yeah, it's just it's just energy, and it's just a different world. I don't get it. I don't have that kind of energy. But I I was very inspired by what he did because I mean, like I said, I also I, I also make music, or you know, it's been a long-standing hobby of mine. Clearly, kind of the same thing for him. Like he used to do it when he was like a young guy, and now that he's a you know huge famous cartoonist d doing thousands of pages of comics for the last twenty years, like thirty, forty years, whatever, he can just kind of mix the two together and just kind of trick people into showing up to hear him play a few songs. I think that's very inspiring. Like, I hope I do that when I'm his age. Cartoonist Kayfabe is subsidized by the comic books that we make. Jim Rugg and I are Eisner Award winning cartoonists who, when we're not doing our YouTube stuff, busy at the drawing table, working on our latest comics. Hulk 316 says that's the date that you pick up Jim Rugg's Hulk Grand Design Monster in March and Madness in April. 40 pages of comics uh, in each of those two issues. A high octane distillation of 40 years worth of Incredible Hulk lore. Probably what, four or five hundred issues worth of material, Jimmy? Five hundred issues. <laughs> and I've been going through them all week, making final uh, edits for I, that first issue. I'm thinking we're going to have more Hulk videos on uh, the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel, but look at these incredible covers. You're not going to miss them on the racks. Uh, first issue is coming buttressed with 
a heap of variant covers. Uh, first off, we'll take a look at the Eddie P variant by way of Todd McFarlane and the Herb Trippy John Romita design of that OG. When are we going to bring back the whiskers, Wolverine, man? Also the button nose. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes very important. And the cute little beep. Marcos Martin does a variant cover of a great Hulk transition sequence. Men love the line work on that middle curvy piece. And the Peach Momoko uh, variant cover, The Cottage Industry Unto Herself, has provided a She-Hulk, Incredible Hulk variant, man, where she is holding up that little Volkswagen <laughs> like it ain't nothing, man. What else you got to say about it, Jimmy? Anything? That's about it, man. I'm sending my final edits to for print to Marvel tomorrow. So whenever you see this video, they've already gone out. And uh, you, know, you know the drill, Ed, that last week before you actually send this off to the printer... It is everything. Every idea that you hope to get in there, every note that I had for myself, like I am working around the clock here. I'm in the last uh, 48 hours of this. I don't want to call it a grind. It's more of like the the, the, the kick at the end of the race to get this thing to be the, uh, the the extra 10% you put in at the end that we hear the great cartoonists talk about. That's what I'm aiming for right now. So it's all excitement on my end for it. And 316, all I need is Stone Cold to retweet it now. And <laughs> I feel like this journey is complete. I am not impressed by the way that Marvel uh, promotes anything, man, let alone uh, the King Kayfaber's Hulk grand design. So it's up to the Kayfabe audience, man, to show up in a big way and make this thing an incredible success. Red Room, the antisocial network, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit, is my comic that I've been putting my energies to lately. The first trade paperback, uh, the antisocial network, is in stores uh, today. If you didn't get that first uh, four-issue miniseries, or you want to get your hands on some extras in the meantime before my next round comes out, you got to get the trade paperback because there's about 70 pages of extra material, behind-the-scenes commentary, uh, and it, a, a complete kind of quick and dirty comic that has uh, been drawn as a kind of a first draft of what Red Room might have been. Uh, in stores now, going quick, get your hands on it ASAP. And coming actually... Uh, March 9th, man, a week before your uh, Hulk Grand Design comic is uh, Trigger Warnings. Issue 1 is going to be coming out. Same deal as the previous round of Red Room comics. Every issue is completely self-contained. Uh, you're going to get a complete story in each issue. This first issue is going to be the Rat Queen story that I have up there on Patreon right now if you want to hit, hit that up. Uh, another round of uh, variant covers for this as well. Here's the Eddie P variant going for like a kind of a, 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 a book cover vibe. With that piece, Peach Momoko does her variant cover, and the great Jim Rugg provides his retail incentive variant cover by way of Robert Crumb's Zap Comics Zero. Jimmy and I have link trees in the description below this video where you can get to all of our links, including our Patreons, where Jim is putting up uh, some pretty compelling behind-the-scenes material on his Patreon, and I'm serializing the Red Room comics before they hit paper. Hit those links uh, below, and uh, now that we're done paying our bills, back to the video. We mentioned, uh, you know, like he does Man Ben, and we get to see these glimpses of how everybody works, and uh, one of the things I've been interested in asking you about, Brian, is it seems like you have, well, you tell me, do you have a team of people that you work with? Everything from, like, um, people that read, say, an outline when you're putting a new series together. Uh, you've had art assistants on some of your books. I'm curious about the working, you know, kind of as a team and, and if you could tell us about your team. I, I don't have, like, a persistent team. It's just, it's kind of an illusion. Um, <clears throat> I worked with a, with a couple guys on the last volume of Scott Pilgrim. Um, John Kantz, who lives in Seattle, uh, he's a couple years older than me, and he's kind of like a real like classic like manga 80s style uh guy like he's just he can bust out like those amazing like buildings and sci-fi shit and um he can make up like machines he's just like he comes from a different kind of discipline than me and um that was really helpful for scott pilgrim like because i needed a lot of uh i wanted to do a lot of like made up stuff in the background of scott pilgrim volume six um and another guy worked on that one called aaron anchetta who um who I found doing porn of Scott Pilgrim. So he was really good at replicating my style. Doujinshi. And I worked Exactly, yeah. So I've worked with him a couple times over the years. Um, and then on, on um, seconds, I, I got a couple other assistants. I got, um, well, I started working with Nathan Fairbairn, who's kind of become like my, my go-to colorist. Um, he's awesome. And he colored all of Scott Pilgrim and seconds. And then I also worked with um, Jason Fisher from Portland, who is uh, um, 
I don't know. He's just he helps me like in a whole bunch of ways. He's he's kind of like um, his his art style is more like fantasy ish, which which worked for seconds. Um, but yeah, I don't have like a stable of people. Um, I still kind of mostly sit here alone in my room. No one no one really reads the outlines. Um, no editor. Well, I I. So I started working on this new book after seconds, and I've literally, I think I've, I'm on my fifth editor. Editors have a high turnaround at these big publishers. Um, they just keep quitting. Um, so I, I just don't, I don't, I have like a new one that I like, but it's like, it, then we've been in the pandemic, so I haven't really gotten to work with her too much, but we'll get there. Is your writing style pretty consistent? And I'll give you a more specific question for that. It's impressive to me, whenever we met, you you had just done the first Scott Pilgrim, uh, Volume 1. But you had planned it, like, pretty clearly that it was going to be, you know, six volumes. And I don't know if you knew how long it would take. But, like, I, I'm always unsure how someone has that kind of confidence to, to commit to something that long. What, what, what are you writing at that point? Like, have you written the whole series? Like, tell us about your writing process a little. Um, <clears throat> it's another illusion, I think. <laughs> but... Um... Uh, for Scott Pilgrim, I I really wanted to do a big series. I've always I always wanted to when I was younger, um, but not that big. Like I definitely had like a scope in mind, and I thought six was probably a good number. And um, I think at the beginning, like I just I I had the first three sort of planned out, and I knew that it was a book where he fights a bunch of guys. So at the end, he's gonna have to fight someone and hopefully win. Um, and that's. Uh, you know, I had like a bunch of characters, and and then I just kind of like was winging it, and um, and it kind of worked out. And I, yeah, I looking back now, I'm just like, you know, that was what what year is it? It was, it was like 18 years ago, the first volume. So um, was it really I, that long ago? Yeah, we've been in the game a long time, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I probably met you, Jim, uh, that year when Scott Pilgrim came out, maybe at SPX, because that was. Uh, I don't remember if that was my first SPX, but definitely 04, I was there. Yeah, that's that's where I got a copy um, and, and where we met. And it was like out of nowhere. I, I had not seen Lost at Sea uh, before that. That It was just like, here's one of, you know, a couple hundred cartoonists here at SPX. This book looks good. All right, here we go. And then being shocked by reading it, you know, a week later or something when I got home and just being like, what is this? Who's this guy? Where's this coming from? But yeah, totally random. Like, talk about when SPX was like my favorite show to do because that's what would happen at SPX. It'd be a bunch of cartoonists from all over the world that I didn't know. Um, you know, it was early days of social media, so this stuff wasn't promoted the way it is now, where you know everything months before it comes out. That was just out of nowhere. And talk about like the great surprise to, to go home with. Um, yeah, you guys reminded me of that one uh, a couple weeks ago. You posted the best Wolverine comic ever. And I, I have that book, um, and that was that same year. So like, and actually, I remember um, I missed meeting Mike Mignola. He came to my table while I was like walking around, like the one time I walked around. And they're like, "Oh, you just missed him. He he thought Scott Pilgrim was so cool." And like, I, I've still never met him, but um, I did pick up the Jeffrey Brown Wolverine at that time. That was my first SPX man, and there there was a buzz about Scott Pilgrim at at that show for sure. And I remember like some of the conversations uh i don't know if they these people talked to you or if there was some popular interview you did at the time or something but t like talks of scott pilgrim becoming a multimedia experience was like those talks were going on at that spx even like oh this is going to be movies this is going to be you know he's he's planning for this he's planning like it's going to be this and that and uh when it all start comes to fruition I still think about those conversations. Was that something you were chasing or op open to? Did you have, did you have, uh, you know, some infrastructure set up to to pitch this into Hollywood or any of that kind of thing? Um, I guess sort of. I mean, Oni kind of was moving in that direction. Oni Press was kind of moving in that direction at the time. Um, it was supposed to be the book was supposed to be out at Comic Con, and I turned it in like literally like an hour late in the printer deadline they had some big job coming up and they moved it a week back and then it had to come out at sbx which is like a month later so i i had tickets to comic-con i flew out to san diego and i was sitting there at a table with nothing 
So that was that was my worst Comic Con. But by the um, way, like every young cartoonist circle this as your deadline story. Like one hour late, (laughs) what that can translate to in the real world. Yeah, it it was it was truly just uh, it felt like shit. (laughs) But um, but yeah, SPX there was the book had only been out for like a month maybe, and there was not very many copies. Um, but it did it did kind of instantly get buzz and I, I was I was very heartened by that um, and I did I mean so the movie was eventually made by Edgar Wright and I I think I heard from him before the end of that year so that was only like two months later you know um, so it kind of started circulating and people really started talking about it really fast one of the uh, one of the things that made Scott Pilgrim stand out to me is bringing in like video game pieces that that fit very smoothly in the narrative and it seemed like that was something that we were at a point where that was becoming more of an influence but i hadn't really seen it applied smoothly and integrated well in a story um how conscious were you of of that brian i assume video games were you know obviously an influence but i mean were you sort of like thinking i've got something different here with with how this fits i don't know if it I don't know how much that kind of stuff pops in the first book. Like, I don't think it was really the... It wasn't like I set out to be like, I'm going to combine manga and video games. And, and, um, you know, I just started throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks. And and the video game stuff, as the books went on, it kind of... It was kind of... It made the most sense to me, and it kind of became the underpinning of the whole thing. I think by book three or four, like, I was was really set on that path. but yeah, I mean, I was kind of thinking like, um, it's almost like Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin and Hobbes was really big for me when I was a kid. It's just like this, these two guys talking and, and all this, uh, kind of fantasy stuff hits them. And, um, and the fantasy stuff in my head, like all mostly came from games. I was just, I was a really big gamer when I was a teen and, um, I wasn't like super big on movies. I, I read, I dabbled in lots of different kinds of comics and stuff, but games were kind of like the thing that really like hooked me when I was a teenager. The uh, the aesthetics of Scott Pilgrim, I mean, from from day one, uh, I remember thinking that it has that like, you know, River City Ransom, uh, Super Spike, Dodgeball, like like that's a that's a series. When you go to Japan, you realize that there are like a million of those games with those kind of squat. Mm-hmm. rectangle shaped characters but do you know what that series is called yeah kunio kun is the character so all the all the games in japan have like that name somewhere in them and they're just whatever different titles right right yeah but but i mean that that vibe like you know rang throughout that that first book like very very clearly i guess so yeah i mean in the second volume i did like an explicit river city ransom uh homage but uh yeah, that game was huge for me. Like, I think when I was 10 years old or whatever, like, I, I had a sleepover with my best friend, and, like, we rented that game and played the shit out of it all night. And, and like, even just, like, one night with a game like that can, like, just really take a huge grip on my soul. Uh, so that that was huge for me. And, and like, the way that that kind of dovetailed with comics, when I started thinking about doing a comic, especially a longer series, I was like, what what happens in a comic? Like, people fight? I guess it's like about fighting like there's got to be some kind of like visual expression of conflict and then my experience of fighting was just purely river city ransom street fighter 2 you know that world so that's kind of naturally where i gravitated when i started trying to depict fighting i had no martial arts background it's just purely street fighter moves punch a dude and he says barf and a coin pops out of his head yeah exactly so I brought I brought that to the masses somehow. I just I don't know. It's it's crazy looking back now, like because it's become such a. When I started doing it, in like in oh four oh five, like the doing Nintendo references was not. Uh, it didn't seem cool. I wasn't doing it to like get a market share. You know, I was just doing it because that's I thought my friends would respond to it basically. It's how it works. I feel like, man, like if you're part of a certain generation, like like somebody's got to be the one, man, to to sort of broach that uh, back into into pop culture relevance or something. We all grew up with the stuff. We're all the ones buying the book, so you drop something right. like that in there, man. It, it it strikes that chord. I think it makes sense too in comics, uh, especially American comics that are dominated by superheroes. There's such a history of like 
a certain type of fighting, right? You know, Kirby fight scenes or whatever, to bring in a, a, a pretty different angle for a fight scene. Um, you know, it's one of the things that stood out to me the first time I read it, where it's like, this all works. Where's it coming from? I'm not used to seeing this in comics. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to do a new looking fight scene in comics just because you know, I'm staring at long boxes, uh, tens of thousands of these comics that are all have a certain form of fighting in them. So, yeah, it makes sense that a new, uh, you know, you would bring that in from a new influence. It would stand out. Well, the other part of that was the fact that I got to do it as a, as a graphic novel, an OGN. So it's like 160 pages, and I had never conceived of a, a work that long. But when I started thinking about it, I thought, oh, I can use this to my advantage to kind of trick everyone into thinking that it's this kind of straightforward slice of life thing and then only in the last 40 pages does it kind of go nuts and so I think if you're kind of on board and then you get to that page turn and everything goes crazy then and you're still on board with that then you're kind of hooked for life and um, I don't know I just I had this urge to kind of like be be tricky like pull the rug out and I'm um, sorry that's a, not a play on your name Jim um, <laughs> but yeah it's I, I, in the years after it first came out, I thought that was like a big advantage because it could have been a four issue miniseries and then the fourth issue would have been a fight and um, it wouldn't have been the same. Was it your suggestion, editorial suggestion, for it to be a 160 page book? Uh, the graphic novel thing, you know, Top Shelf was doing their thing for sure, but it was mm -hmm. still a new, newish idea to do a big, you know, to devote a year, two years, however many years to, to put something together. So what was the impetus for, for the Tanko Bonds? Well, it happened with Lost at Sea first. Because um, Lost at Sea came out... Oh, I was going to say that too. Lost at Sea only came out eight months before Scott Pilgrim, which wow. when I look back I was like, well, how did I do that? Um, so Lost at Sea was going to be a four-issue series at first. And I was planning it as such. And then partway through, Oni was just... Uh, I don't know, I think also a couple things happened that year in 2003. I know Blankets came out, and that was huge for a lot of us. Um, just even if you don't like the book that much, it's just the format and the, the fact that he put out this 700-page book was very impressive. Um, and maybe just the economics were starting to make more sense to do a graphic novel. So, so Lost at Sea became a graphic novel. And... Um, and then the, the kind of the Tokyo pop explosion was happening around the same time. So all those kind of Tankoban sized books were floating around. And I thought, okay, I'll ride this wave and I can make a book the same format. Lost at Sea was not the same uh, trim size as a, as a Tokyo pop, but Scott Pilgrim was intentionally. It was just like, this is a format that people are going to understand for the next few years. So let's, let's try this out. And I don't really see it shelved with manga per se, but, um, I do think it like it helped in people's brains. That format stuff's really uh, it's it's a topic I'm always interested in because I do a lot of self publishing and so you're responsible for making some of those decisions. Uh, so it's interesting to hear your thought about that a little bit because I mean at some point pretty early that informs your creative process. You know if you're going from four issues to no I'm actually going to do 160 page one one volume. Um, you know effects writing planning all of that even the size of the the trim it felt like that was a good size for reading, which again, good cartoonist, that, that's a part of the creative process, is figuring out how big is this art, how big are my pages that I'm working with. Easy way to explain that would be like, say if it is a four issue mini series, usually let's say it's you know an even number of pages. So the last page of an issue would be on like a left facing page of a book. And you would, if you were teasing it out over several issues, you would have your little cliffhanger piece to try to sell people on grabbing the next issue. You just don't do that if it's a bigger work because how are you teasing something on this page when I'm clearly looking at this page here? Like yeah. it, 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 it affects the writing a little bit. It affected everything. Like it affected the drawing. I, I started drawing a really small size, which I loved because it just made it faster. Everything was faster. And I, had, I only had an 8.5 by 11 scanner, so that was like... Oh, if I draw it, this, I started drawing, um, it was kind of like 7 by 11. It was a four, 11 by 14, I cut it in half, and then I could fit each page in my scanner in one go instead of having to patch things together. And that just saved, you know, if I save half an hour per page, I'm, I'm burning through pages way faster. 
That sounds like such a mong- uh, mangaka kind of yeah. mentality. I mean, you know, half hour times 160, we're talking Earth days of a, of a man's life that's yeah. being saved. I mean, and, and instead of drawing at 10 by 15, like just going down to a small size, I didn't kind of like fill the pages with unnecessary detail. Um, like later in the series, I moved up to a larger page size and I did start kind of like, the, the art looks better, but I did also add unnecessary detail, I think. What do you uh, what do you remember about Oni Press around that time? At, at such an interesting period in comics for me. I mean, it's that's literally the rise of the graphic novel. Uh, you know that time frame around there, like oh three to oh six, oh seven, somewhere in there is when we see the Tokyo Pops come to bookstores and stuff. So, what do you remember about Oni? Like, you know, were you working oh. closely with them? Were they pretty hands on? Were they? saying we can do that yeah, we can't do that yeah at the time it's like we knew them for like you know kevin smith comics yeah i knew them from china clugston right like i loved uh blue monday because that was like one of the few people doing kind of like uh anime manga kind of thing but also mixing it with the western style like you know she's influenced by archie or by jaime hernandez and um that was when I started like kind of looking around thinking I should publish like that, that publisher appealed to me basically just for that aesthetic reason. Um, cause they did something that resembled the stuff I would like to do. And actually my, I think my pitch for Scott Pilgrim was basically just blue Monday meets dragon ball. So they got that. Um, <clears throat> but as far as like what, I don't remember what else was happening around that time but it was yeah it was like the transition from issues into graphic novels and i think nowadays they do a lot of graphic novels um and the tokyo pop thing was happening the spx and like the small conventions were happening um you you had Klaus and those guys making a shift to pantheon and publishing the big hardcovers of uh yeah. david boring and black hole and stuff yeah didn't the um the big chris ware first book uh the uh what is it rusty the boy genius or uh, no it's not rusty jimmy, jimmy corrigan. corrigan was a bit earlier but like that go. year of that spx was the big red acme novelty date book that like 11 oh, by 17 yeah. si- sized yeah, yeah, one yeah, yeah 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 i was obsessed with those giant uh he had that sketchbook around that same time too yeah that that was um Oh, the, yeah, kind of the big guys were shifting towards graphic novels and and towards these more designy things um and Blankets came out. That was, Blankets was huge for me. That was when I was working on Lost at Sea, maybe. And, um, you know, I went to MoCA and got in line and got Blankets. Signed. Everyone was in line. I remember that year at MoCA. That was probably my first MoCA. Um, you know, going to New York City as a young adult was, was a lot of fun. Like, um, it's just all that stuff is just kind of mixed up with being young and, and discovering things. So it's hard for me to remember exactly, like, I never visited Oni Press. I don't know what their culture was at the time. It was like three guys, maybe. It was very small. And um, it just kind of suited my purposes. And I, and I happened to meet one of them at, um, I met James Lucas Jones, the editor, in uh, 2001. I went to Chicago, maybe it was Wizard World at that time. I went to Chicago that summer. And I met him, and I had known him a little bit online, and I just started talking to him more after after we met in person, and eventually pitched Lost at Sea and pitched Scott Pilgrim. It's such an interesting arc. I actually did visit uh, Oni Press. Uh, my wife was looking at a school in Portland, and um, I, I don't know why I knew James Lucas Jones, whatever, from making comics, crossing paths at wherever, these conventions. But I went to their offices while she was like looking at the school. And... Um, I remember Corey Lewis's Shark Knife was coming out. I was super excited to pull that off. The sh- you know they had like their advanced stuff laying there. I was like, you take some and stuff. Um, but it seemed like you know like I think of Scott Pilgrim in is as like Oni transitions into kind of what they would become. Scott Pilgrim, if you think of traditional publishing models, you need a book. You need a hit. Yeah. You know, a publisher needs a book that they sort of build around. And Scott Pilgrim was that book. Uh, you know, I don't know if they recognized it early on, but by the time like second, third, fourth volumes were coming out, like the print runs must have gone up each volume uh, as those were released, right? It was a huge deal when new volumes would come out. I think so. Yeah, because the first one, uh, I, I strongly remember it did it did worse than Lost at Sea in Diamond uh, pre-orders. Like it was like sub one thousand numbers. And I was just like, okay, this is the end. This is the end of the career. So just might as well put everything into this book. And um, 
but yeah, the last, I think volume six, we printed a hundred thousand. Like, so that was only five, six years later. Um, so, and I don't, I still like, I don't know what to attribute it to other than the internet. Like we were just kind of there when the internet was still a bit of a, like a wild place and you could kind of just sneak stuff in there and, and get into people's consciousness. There was some, some social stuff happening, nothing, nothing, uh, like, uh, Instagram, Facebook, but there were the forums and there were people who were devoted to those forums, certainly. And that would, that would be the talk of, uh, of those forums. Now, now you said volume six comes six years later. So we're talking, we're talking a year, a book, uh, a page every three days. Yeah, more or less, um, a year per book uh there was it, it got a little slower in the second half but i also moved across the country uh, a couple of times <laughs> i was not very um not very stable in my in my kind of day-to-day life um but yeah i was like i was i lived in three different three or four different houses at the you know during the those books <laughs> So, um, you know, I just worked whenever I could. I remember, I remember the first volume very strongly. Like I remember I drew the whole, there's a kind of a fight scene at the end where almost every page is a double page spread. And I drew all of that in one night, like from 1am to 6am or something, which I could never do. I haven't seen those hours in years, but, um, you know, yeah, I just, I was just pumping out and, and it was just kind of my life. And then, you know, and I was married at the time to a cartoonist. So it, it was, uh, we, you know, we had a schedule. We'd sit in the office all day drawing, and and it was very conducive to getting work out. What's your schedule like now? Do you have a regular routine? I I haven't really been able to establish a full routine. I mean, I'm not I'm not really deep in drawing a book right now. I I just dabble in a whole bunch of stuff. You know, like you said, I'm writing Snot Girl. Uh, I'm writing other stuff, and then just kind of like. Now I just like I have to be the brand manager for Scott Pilgrim for the rest of my life, so, which takes up way more of my time than I want it to, um, way away from drawing, you know. So that's just it's it's just like as I get older, and then also I want to live my life. Uh, when you're twenty something, you're just like okay, comics, comics, comics. Let's just let's just do this forever. But you know, I've I've had some injuries and stuff. Like I can't draw as freely as I once did. So I, I just I take more time off. I remember Arosawa in like the the precursor to Man Ben, he uh, the the cameras are focused on him, and you know he's doing his daily thing, man drawing comics all day, all night, all the time, and they the cameras travel with him to go to a doctor's visit, and they said that his so he's let's just say he's right-handed, his left shoulder was literally deformed because of doing exactly what I'm doing right now, adding weight to the shoulder for 10 hours a day as he's drawing with the other hand it's like you know uh, corsetry or chinese foot binding or something like it's it's changing the integrity and shape of his bone structure so stuff comes with a cartoon and for sure man yeah you know the takeaway there is figuring out yoga or some kind of intervals you or watch weight lift i don't know you know the solution but something to try to like you, counter train that you watch the um the Miyazaki Studio Ghibli documentary and he has all of his people it's like you know there's a regimented time where we get up and everybody's doing their stretches together man and dudes you know I think just celebrated like an 84th birthday uh, a couple of days ago I think still going strong still looks great gotta move the bones use it or lose it um yeah I mean I, I try to kind of warm up every day like I have a little workout oh actually I forgot to take down you can see my uh my pull down <laughs> strap right there that helps um you know and then i I, i've had like a physical trainer and stuff but i haven't seen my physical trainer in two years because of the pandemic so um you know you just kind of you just kind of deal try not to play too many video games that hurt my arm as much as drawing hurts my arm hurt your arm man you still on the wii with the with the action (laughs) sword slashes and shit no it's just it's just everything you know like the hand just like every part of the hand can lead to pain somewhere in the body like it's all connected so it's like everything i do kind of leads back to my shoulder i i injured my shoulder like almost 10 years ago when i was working on seconds so it definitely it hasn't been quite the same since and it'll never it never will be and that's something that took a while to kind of understand um you know i thought i would bounce back and just like be just churning out pages again but it's just it hasn't really quite come to that yet like it's it's been a few years and i have not been churning out pages maybe i will one day but we're 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 getting there 
there are two pieces that I always think about just like as we continue on throughout the years, man, and you know, your, your, your body changes, your schedule changes, the, your ability to pull all nighters changes. Uh, Charles Schultz really hated the wobbliness of his line once he had whatever issues he had and, and, you know, it was a physical, like a tangible thing that you could point to that like, you know, you are not what you used to be. I like the line. Those comics yeah. look beautiful to me. We we love the line. And uh, in the Tezuka documentary, he's lamenting his older age and, oh, I can't draw a perfect circle any longer. All of my characters based on a circle. He did Phoenix after that. You know, like he did yeah. amazing, incredible works after that. So I always just got to keep those two pieces in mind that like whatever you think is what you think, but you could still be very relevant. Still, still, still do really good, solid work, man. It's just, you know, ev evolution, like your, your body's going to change over time. The, the other thing while we're on the subject is, uh, is the eyesight. Like I am, um, I just got these glasses last year, but these are, these are like old man reading glasses. And like, I didn't even realize like that my vision, like in, you know, the like two feet from my eyes where I draw where I live like that that starts to go and like then I start to understand why Frank Miller draws the way he does like in DK2 and stuff like that like it's not because you your ideas about drawing change but maybe it's your relationship to the page changes you're kind of sitting in a different way because your eyes just just don't absorb the information the same way anymore and then and that just leads to changes all around so it, I don't know it's interesting to me it, it is. We talk about that a lot, man. Like the the cartoonist that has the good posture, it could sit like that and just have the arm way out there. That's yeah. a different look. At, like Jeff Darrow probably doesn't do that, you know, to draw every rivet and nut and bolt. You got to get you got to get microscopic. But there there is the macro style that you can you know move the wrists a lot, sit back, sit up, far away from the page, and it's just it's a different aesthetic. Yeah, I had um, eye exam last year and was talking to my doctor about eye strain and you know all these things and it was like i think her thing was like 20 minutes on the work and then look at something 20 feet away for 20 seconds i believe was her uh they always narc you out man <laughs> like uh, you do a lot of close work don't you like you're always looking at the computer and it's like well i'm looking at a white piece of paper like this far from my face same thing yeah while we're on the topic brian has your process changed much do you still work on paper do you do layouts for your pages walk us through a process i'm I would say like I've never been fully satisfied with the process of comics. It it always it always there's always some nagging thing like I I can't write and draw at the same time 100% of the time. Um so I've tried a whole bunch of different ways. Scott Pilgrim I mostly did full script um and wrote it like a screenplay. Seconds I wrote kind of a more detailed outline. I worked from that and I did digital pencils um where I could kind of like place the words and then work from there. Um, Cause I usually would, I usually place balloons first because that anchors the page and you don't have to draw what's under the balloons. That's kind of been my go-to strategy. Um, but yeah, getting to the page is the hard part. Like getting, figuring out the script and the, and the, you know, I love doing thumbnails. I, I still, um, I still will like print out a, a sheet of thumbnails and do them like really small, like an inch, inch and a half uh, fit nine or, Fit, how many do I fit? Two, four, six, eight. Eighteen. I fit eighteen on a page on a computer page, and I've been doing that like since Scott Pilgrim. But I didn't do that on seconds. I I went straight to computer on seconds. Will you provide that kind of stuff uh, to the artist on on Yeah, Snockerel? sure, sure. Oh, oh, on Snock Girl. Yeah. Um, that's another one where the process has kind of kept evolving because uh, I did a couple of times. I would I would kind of do more thumbnails and more layouts, and then you know, maybe that makes the artist bored and the, the artist is not engaged in the same way. So I'm constantly just trying to write something that'll get the artist excited to draw it. And, and maybe that means like the script is really minimal or maybe it means the script is like full of information. Um, but I don't like to draw too much because I don't want to impose my vision on them. Is Snuck Girl still going on? It's, it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, that's a, Good question. Yeah, it is. We, we are working on it, but it's been on hi hiatus for at least two years. Like we literally, we went on hiatus the week of the um, pandemic. We didn't know it was coming. Last issue came out March 11th, 2020. So um, 
and we are we were planning to go on a hiatus because um because my mom passed away the year before so the last year we were working on snock girl I, like my mom had cancer and i was traveling a lot and so it slowed way down and it's not the kind of thing i want to go out uh telling everyone like oh i'm i'm slow on this comic because my mom has cancer like it's just not it's not a fun story it's not um and most people don't care or they won't hear and they're just like oh where's my comic book it's late so um you know and then and then with the pandemic like it slipped into into a longer hiatus but we have been writing it and hopefully she's drawing it we'll, we'll get there we're, we're hoping to put some more issues out later this year very sorry for your loss brian oh thanks guy um, um you know it's just whatever i'm i'm turning 43 this year we're getting up there buddies that's right man those 40s that's that prostate exam <laughs> yeah I'm, 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 like if i die from a plane crash for my next vacation like don't feel sad for me man because that means i escaped the thumb up the butt or whatever is going to happen <laughs> i'm as yeah. nervous for that as the first time like I, I pulled my pants down and had to get the, the 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 sack juggled by the school nurse turn the head and cough. oh jeez i don't think i yeah. slept the whole week be- before knowing that that shit was coming oh man <laughs> um i want to go back to image for a little bit Image yeah. has had, I feel like they've had a couple of different interesting waves throughout their publishing history. And I don't know, within the last, and, and my time is bad, maybe about a decade ago, they started being really interesting again with all of these series they were publishing. And I would put Snot Girl into that kind of like renaissance or whatever this current phase is. How has that experience been for you coming from predominantly graphic novels to writing a, a you know, single comic book issues? What is that, is that very different or... Uh, It is. Yeah. I had never worked in the single issue format before. So even just writing to that size is different for me. Uh, I mean, that that chunk of whatever, 22, 24 pages, it's it always feels like not quite enough. It feels like 90 percent of a story, um, which I struggle with, especially when I'm not drawing. You know, it's I feel like as, as as an artist, I would just kind of like cram more shit in or something. I would find some way to to, but I, I want it to feel balanced as a writer. My first image, um, you know, like you guys, it, it was like back in the day, like uh, Young Blood and, and Wild Cats and all that stuff. So that that's my concept of image. And then they had that second wave where it was more black and white. I got really into um, Replacement God, uh, Xander Cannon, like, and... Um, and then yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know what they were putting out at the time that I kind of was pitching Snock Girl, but um, I know um, Robert Kirkman had been kind of trying to get me to do something at Image for a while. And uh, when I started talking to Leslie about about you know kind of tricking her into drawing a comic with me, uh, Image just seemed like a kind of a natural place to try. I'd never tried Image. Um, I've heard lots of things. I know lots of people who do, do Image books, but um, thought I would try it for myself. And uh, it's it's pretty good. I, I don't know. I, I I feel like I've dropped the ball a lot with, with how slow I've put issues out of Snark Girl. So I don't have like the full experience of, of image because I'm I'm just a slacker apparently. How is writing for another artist? Is this the first time you've done that? Yeah, I think it is the first time I've I've written for someone. Um it is like I said, it's like it I'm not even writing the script for an audience of any kind. I'm writing it just for her. And trying to write the things that'll that'll get her excited or whatever, you know, just trying trying to write you know, we obviously we work on the story together, but when I'm when I'm actually scripting, it's just a matter of I know like I could change all the dialogue later, I could make the joke funnier in the lettering phase if I need to, but um I just need to write something that'll get her to understand what's happening and, and get her to convey that to the audience. And it, it, that, that's a whole challenge because I'm, I feel like I'm such a visual person. It's a little harder for me to write, um, purely in words. Brian, are you, are you from Toronto? Uh, I'm from, I mean, from that area. I'm from London, Ontario, or I was born in London, Ontario, which is about two hours away from Toronto. What was the comics culture like, uh, around there? Cause we could certainly the it's Toronto proper, heck of a literate comic book yeah. town did you ever make the trek in into toronto go to the beguiling meet anybody um not really until later when i was in high school i didn't really spend a lot of time in toronto um but i would go down so i had this friend uh sherman chan and we would his family owned a pharmacy and they would drive down to the chinese mall outside toronto 
every couple of weekends and we would go with them because they had this killer arcade down there and that's where i played all my like street fighter alpha and all those games um and they had like stores that would sell imported anime stuff or bootleg anime stuff probably um so that's kind of like when i in my late teens i got i kind of like dipped out of comics for a bit and got really into anime manga. Um, but so I moved to Toronto uh, in 2001, um, New Year's Eve of 2002. And I moved with Chris Butcher, who you guys might know, who's, uh, you know, we lived together. We started shopping at The Beguiling. He became friendly with them and he kind of got a job there. And I was doing my comics, trying to do my comics. And, um, and then, you know, it's kind of became... Uh, we kind of became central to that Toronto scene for a minute, which was weird. And, and he still kind of is. And he, so he founded TCAF, which is a huge festival now. And that was in 03, I think. So it was around the same time I was doing, I was starting out. He was starting out in his journey. And, um, you know, and it, and it was Toronto. So we had what we had Seth and Chester and, and Joe Matt. And I'm, I encountered all those guys. Like I worked at the beguiling for a while in 03, 04. And uh, I don't know. It was it was a very fruitful scene. There was and there was other pocket scenes happening. There was Udon. Uh, I, I did some work for Udon, who did um, uh, like Street Fighter comics and stuff like that. And and I was really torn between kind of like the the anime video game world and then like the indie, the black and white world. I was super into Jeff Smith, but I was equally into like Ayazawa and like I was just. Uh, absorbing a lot of stuff working at the beguiling was was huge like just for kind of getting more of a breadth of comics education at that age great shop man it's it's hard to imagine a beguiling before chris butcher this is yeah i know yeah, yeah I, I i like know both of those people or, or i guess the shop and the person as simultaneously like they were together whenever i met them so it's always been like hand in hand beguiling and chris butcher that's a that's an interesting group. What a uh, like what a power uh, apartment you guys are running from like a comics <laughs> standpoint in the early two thousands. Right. Like, well, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't yet. Like, it was really it, we only lived together for maybe two years, and you know, by the end of that, we were just getting started on our on our kind of like indie comics dominance. But um, you know, we've we've been we've been fast friends ever since. What what was what was Chris about at that time? Like, if he if he didn't was was he in a creative headspace or yeah he was doing a bit of both um he worked in retail though uh previously like he worked in this in the suburbs at some small store and uh the way we started kind of communicating was online i don't remember which forum it was it might have been the warren ellis forum i don't remember um there was a couple different kind of comics forums and stuff and i i became aware of him he would post a lot i think he had a blog and uh, for whatever reason, we worked together on this Spider-Man uh, book for babies that I did in like in late 2001, early 2002. So that's 20 years ago. Is that right? It was 2022. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, that those months, like tw exactly 20 years ago, I was um, drawing this 16 page whatever uh little spider-man book and he helped me with the color flats and that was kind of the first time we worked together and we started talking about moving in together because we both wanted to move to toronto and then we made it happen man mentioning forums really kind of brings me back a little bit uh what what was your i don't know fandom uh, interaction on forums in terms of, of being a cartoonist were you making web comics in late 90s early 2000s what do you remember from that time period I guess so. I I mean, I was trying. I think I had this thing in my in my teens, um, really until I did Lost at Sea. I had this thing where I couldn't get past like twelve or thirteen pages of a comic. Like I would I would start it and then I would get stuck. I would get bogged down. Also, the art style would change completely from page one to page twelve. Um, so I, I have a lot of like twelve page things that were supposed to be like a thousand page things, you know. That's that, that teen mentality. Um, it, I don't know. Now I've, I've lost it. I will, bring me back, Jim. What, what were we talking about? I'm curious about your online uh, comics, Oh, yeah, yeah, the forums. Comics. Yeah. I, so I, I can never remember what, 
which forum was which. I was definitely into the Warren Ellis forum. Like, I remember uh, talking to a lot of people for the first time on the Warren Ellis forum. But then I, I might misremember which forum was which or what forums existed. I know Oni Press also had a forum, which I probably was involved with. Remember that um, Comics Journal one, man, whenever Gary Panther came out and was like, you give me $100 in three words and I'm going to draw you something. <laughs> That was sick as hell. And then everybody was uh, putting up the drawing. You know, yeah. every, like he, he got a lot of hundred dollar bills and everybody was putting up their, their image of like what oh, he drew cool. for them. I spent a lot of yeah, time. That was one I of was the not... places I would hang out a lot. And... <laughs> that's fine. I don't even think I don't think I knew about that one. I was I was like a totally different angle to comics than you guys were, I think. Like I didn't know about the Qbert school and stuff. I didn't go to art school. I didn't really have any opportunity I felt to learn more about comics other than being self-taught and then and then getting online and talking to other people. Like I know I, I started talking to Matt Fraction pretty early on. I remember that. Um, and there was kind of like a circle of people around the same age that um, that eventually kind of blew up. Uh, I mean, in a, in a, in a positive way, like their careers were took off, um, you know, including you, Jim, I didn't know you online, Jim, but I mean, I, I started seeing you guys at SPX and Mocha and whatever. And, um, I remember in, like you mentioned shark knife, but like that year, Oh five SPX, the year after the first Scott Pilgrim, I was just like, all these books are so good. Street angel is so, so fucking good. Someone's, uh, and at that point, I had already gotten my Hollywood interest. And I was like, okay, all this shit is going to become Hollywood. We're going to take over Hollywood. We're going to like come from, go from SBX to Hollywood. And, and it just like, it didn't happen for most people. Like it just, it was just this weird fluky thing for me. But at that time, like I think Sin City, the movie came out that year too. It just, it just seemed like there was this direct pipeline from our brains to the big screen. Those dudes and, were sniffing around, though, man, because, like, when Scott Pilgrim came yeah. out, like, you know, it was Tobey Maguire's people or whatever, like, like they, they were they were around, man, trying to buy up everything. That's, I mean, I, you know, I, I didn't really know what was going on, and I just wanted to do my comics. And, um, you know, the whole time I was I was involved with the movie thing, it just, I, I felt like I was, like, a Make-A-Wish Foundation child, like, and, and, like, I was dying, and this is, like, the perfect life had been given to me just for a brief moment. Because um, I, I never really, like, thought any of it would happen. I never really thought it was real. And it, it, it is. It's still real. The movie still exists, you know. People still talk about it. Um, but it did feel like a dream at the time. It had to be surreal when you go to that San Diego Comic Con and you see that fucking Michael Sarah vinyl oh, sign yeah. or whatever, like wrapped on the, the the whole facade of like a fucking skyscraper. Like uh, yeah. that's that's got to be insane, man. Yeah, it's a it's a you know was it, it was a dream Pilgrim dream here. come true in a way, it, but also it was a little embarrassing in a way. Uh, <laughs> it was like I don't like I don't like being the center of attention. Um, and that, and that was only a couple of years after I was like, you know, one of the, one of the schlubs in the corner at SPX. Like it just, it happened so fast that it was really hard to process or accept. Um, and I, I felt like I had kind of like, I had to distance myself from indie because, um, I remember going to SPX, maybe it was 2007 or, um, Mocha 2007. And I just, Scott Pilgrim was just getting too popular. Like I just... I would go in there and there would be like a line around the corner just for me. And like the people beside me are like, what the fuck is this? And I don't, I don't like that feeling. I don't want to, I don't want to have a bunch of random people blocking your table and shit. Like, so I kind of had to like, just, just get out of there because, um, the thing just got too popular and I, I couldn't understand why or what I was doing right or wrong. But, um, I just started to feel really awkward and self-conscious in, in that kind of, I became the big fish in the small pond without even realizing it. And, and I kind of had to, to back away from it because I felt like I was causing more problems, uh, for everyone else around me. Maybe that's, maybe that's like fucking ego. I don't know. I don't know what that is, but I just, I got real scared after a while. Have you found, uh, like a comfort zone in comics since then? I mean, sort of, but it's, it's, it's just, it follows me everywhere now. So it's like, if I, if I go to a con, there's going to be a line of kids following me and, um, it's not, it's not going to be the same as it was. Not that I like sitting behind a table, watching all the people go by and not 
give a shit who I am. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it, but, you know, that's like both things are, are, are equally like could be a problem. So, yeah, I mean, I, I've come to terms with being myself and drawing for people and meeting people and, and you know, being something more than my, the humble self I feel like day to day is like not who I am to those kids, you know. So, like, I have to kind of accept that a- aspect of it. Um, so I've, I've gotten relatively good at like interfacing with the readers, but, um, in terms of like interfacing with the, the comics community, like, no, I, f- I feel like, um, uh, I got so much stink eye in 07. I'm just like, I'm not going back, you know? Yeah. There's a lot of that. You hit a certain unit of sales, man. Uh, a lot of the Xerox crowd is definitely going to have that <laughs> hater aid. Yeah. And you know, and it's, and when I'm, it's like the same people there every year I realized after going there for six or seven years. And, and some of those people have been there for years before and they're just going to stay there forever. For me, it was just kind of like a, a brief kind of dalliance with that, uh, indie con world because it just, it, it just, um, the thing blew up too big and it, it was not my intention necessarily. Brian, Brian, did you have to hide your Stephen Platt profits and stuff whenever you lived <laughs> with uh, Chris Butcher? What what would he have to say about that kind of shit? Uh, no, I was I was never on the on the Stephen Platt. So I didn't know about him until I started watching your videos. I don't believe um, that. Yeah, I don't believe that. Like, uh, well, we can we can go back and trace trace the journey. Um, like I yeah, I was into like Liefeld and and Jim Lee like a writer in like '92, like when. When did Image start? Did Image start in 92, 93? Yeah, celebrating her 30th this year. I was, um, so I w- when I got into comics, how do I describe this? I will say I had, I had cousins who were like five years older than me. I don't, I'm, I'm, um, my mom was the youngest of five. My dad was like on the older end of five uh, siblings. So I'm in this weird no man's land where I'm, all my cousins are either like five, ten years older or five, ten years younger. So I was just like this solitary kid. Also, I'm half Asian, so like, and I lived like in the northern Ontario, where it was all white kids. I didn't, I didn't know anyone who looked like me, so I was like, you know, that's the classic comic fan story. But um, I think my first exposure was my older cousins had a pile of um, X Men and Daredevil, like so it was like Frank Miller, Daredevil, from the early '80s, and um, and early '80s X Men. I remember uh, the Life Death issue. I remember reading that when I was a kid and just being like what it's it was like this glimpse into like an adult world because those claremont comics were just like a soap opera and and they had all these kind of like intense adult feelings and i I was like a little kid but um a few years later i got into comics via transformers because um i lived in the north we didn't have cable tv i couldn't watch the cartoon i knew there was a cartoon couldn't see it and one day I walked into the drugstore and found a Transformers comic. And I was like, oh, my God, this is like, this is for me. And then um, the Transformers comics were part of the Marvel Universe, technically. So there was one where Spider-Man shows up and shit like that. And that's kind of like how I found my way back into Marvel. And um, I remember in like fifth grade, all the kids were trading X-Men comics in, in recess. Like X-Men was huge. I don't know what year that was, like uh, 88, 89, maybe. Jim Lee and um, yeah, it was it was so it was Fall of the Mutants. I remember the first two issues I remember seeing um, after those cousins issues back in the day was um, some of the ones that you riffed on for the for the covers, Ed, like the Sylvester covers, the the one where they're all flying, and the one where they're all kind of like electri- electrified. They have like bones. Those are the two first covers I remember seeing, and I was I was hooked from there. And then when Jim Lee came on and I found out he was Korean, I mean, my, you know, my mom's last name is Lee. So I was like, oh, shit, like this is something that a person like me could do. Maybe that was like the first glimpse of it. Um, but then I, I think I, I did fall out when I got into uh, anime and manga for a few years. Um, what were some of the big influences in that space? Rumiko Takahashi was probably the first big, big one. Um, I remember picking up a volume of Ranma and it wasn't the first volume because I was just whatever I could find at the time. It was so confusing on so many levels and, but just so intriguing and that that's stuck with me forever. Sorry. I'm just like, I got like a gas bubble or some shit, man. I'm 42 years old. 
<clears throat> so is everybody uh, who's watching. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I got into that, and then I got kind of into the black and white comics. Like, as a result, maybe, of, of exploring the black and white manga, I came back and, and found Bone. Um, I remember there would be, like, these... Uh, at the, the dollar store, there would be like these bags of like three or four comics. You get them really cheap, and I got a bunch of issues of Bone and Cerebus that way. And um, and then then I found out like the Cerebus, like that dude was local too, right? Like uh, Dave Sim was from like an hour away from me. And the other one I found w- around that time was Seth, and um, he had that book. Uh, it's a good life if you don't weaken. And on the back cover, there was like a map. Uh, of the local of southwestern Ontario where I lived and I was like oh shit this dude's from here like and this is this work is like you know he could be working in the New Yorker or whatever like he was like such a such a stud comics wise um so that kind of made me see more breadth of what could be done in comics and, and then you know I just at that, at that point I was probably like late teens early 20s and um started trying to put it all together at such an interesting time period in comics history where, like, you know, you get Rama, a volume of Rama half and react, respond to it positively. And then you're looking around for more and it's like you land on Bone or you land on Seth because it was just so much, so many fewer options. Now it would just yeah. be, you know, shelves of manga would be your next step or whatever. Um, but back then you were sort of like stuck with, I don't know, I'm still looking in the same spot and whatever catches my eye again. It's almost like random, you know, you're playing pin the tail on the donkey over and over as you as you try to find more of this thing that you've responded to, but then what? I think a part of it too is just like when you're young, you just need to you just need to take in information. So just grab whatever and then you start to make your assessment, but it's like uh wheat from the chaff or, you know, the 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 um 49ers like panning for gold, like you got to grab a lot of stuff and just see what hits what doesn't that's also a time though when when chance was a bigger thing you yeah, know that's yeah. going to the video store and most of the movies i've never heard of so i've oh, got yeah. to look at them and read the backs and kind of guess uh you know i feel like comics were that way for a lot of us at that of a certain age you might fuck with ramna one half man maybe not lum maybe lum isn't isn't <laughs> isn't hitting the mark or maybe you don't it's, see it's lum true, for like yeah. 15 years <laughs> you know yeah it was it was definitely harder to find like ranma was new at the time um, another one that really hit for me was Hicksville. Um, I still look back at Hicksville as being like really influential on me just because it, it kind of presents this world of comics like that didn't exist, but that was such a beautiful vision that it made me want to contribute to it. It made me want to live there, you know? When you were putting seconds together, did you look at like uh, D&Q or, or other publishers as a place for that? You know, thinking of D&Q as being a Canadian publisher... Seth's publisher well, and as as a beguiling guy, um, as a beguiling family person, me, um, you know, I've I've met all everyone from D and Q, and they would never publish me. <laughs> that's like they're up front the about that line. shit too. They're, they're up front. Yeah, they're they're like, listen, we can't sell your stuff, man. We're we're I, bougie. I definitely like probably put feelers out at one point, and it was it was just like a hard no. <laughs> so, um, you know, and then that that was disappointing to me at the time. I was like, this is a Canadian publisher, like that would be a great fit, but not necessarily. And and you know, so I ended up at Oni because, like I said, because the they had kind of those aesthetic notes of like having China Clugston over there, and um, it was just something that that I could reach that that would publish me basically. I love that as a story too. Because uh, I feel like a lot of people go through that where whatever your first choice is, it's not what you get. But, I mean, has that limited your success with Scott Pilgrim at all? You know, like like choosing a publisher that yeah. maybe wasn't your first choice. But so what? It hasn't stopped you or slowed you down at all. D&Q did you a favor, man. Because, like, you know, the, the flip is they could say yes and just fucking orphan you, you know? Like, make sure right. that nobody else publishes it, publish it, not know what to do with it. Now you're lost lost at sea. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I mean, it was, it was, a, like I said, like Nintendo references weren't like kind of a hot thing. And especially when you're an art publisher in 2004, like no one wants to touch that. And even if it is going to turn out to be popular, they wouldn't have wanted to publish it, I think. So uh, I think I ended up in, in the only place I really could have at the time. Man, you know, that, that's that other thing, too, where like when, when you're innovating that, that aspect, the people who are in that position to do the publishing they don't get the references like potentially like they could be you know like a slightly older generation 
who were like, you know, Odyssey or uh, Intellivision uh, people. They don't know from this Nintendo shit. Right. And yeah, just... like when I when I started working with Edgar on the movie, like he's from England and he's five years older than me, so he like had never even seen a Nintendo. So that's why you end up having like Pac Man references in the movie and stuff like that. That's not something I would have written, but it's just it's a cultural references that make that makes sense to the older people who are actually putting the work together. Brian, do you think of uh, anything specific that that how, how would you characterize your work? And I, I'm thinking of seconds and Scott Pilgrim is having innovative narrative techniques on the page. Is that something that you think about when you go into making a project? Like, what's the stamp that you're trying to find or put on a story? Um, yeah, with Seconds, it was more conscious. With, with Scott Pilgrim, it was like... Um, I do have this attitude, like, I, I would like to do as much as I can with the page, like, with the printed page. Um, like, whether it's, like, printing a recipe or, you know, just just something that you can kind of come back to that's kind of how i approach scott pilgrim where like in the first few pages there's like a song with like a guitar tab and um and you know it's just like it's just little little bonus things i was like no no one's gonna want this book so i might as well give them some activities to do if they happen to open it you know just keep them here a little longer and um and and yeah and scott pilgrim kind of has like punk zine aesthetic which was just part of it was just like busting out as fast as I could. Um, and part of it was that that was the culture at the time. Like that, that was 2003, 2004. My friends were like, uh, you know, indie rockers and shit. And, um, and that just made sense to me visually. And then there was seconds. Like I ended up doing this thing where there's like a narrator, but she kind of like talks back to the narrator. And, um, yeah, I guess I just, I always want to surprise myself. I always want to try different things. Um, and I and I always want to play with the formal aspects, maybe not to the degree of like a Klaus or a, or a Chris Ware, but like I, I don't want to leave those formal aspects alone. I don't want it to just be a story that I'm telling through this medium of comics. Like the the comics have to be part of the story. You trigger in some other memories, man, from that 2004 era as the aspect <laughs> because so many cartoonists all in bands. You know, mm, there was oh, a lot yeah. of a lot of musician cartoonists out there at that time. Might still be that way. Who knows? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, M- music's dead. Rock is dead. So we're all the cartoonists are just doing cartoons now. <laughs> I just think about like like you know the 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 great cartoonists. You know, uh, there's a video you can find online. Chris Ware playing like straight up ragtime piano, like super mm. quick and so perfect. And you know, Crumb had his I, band. I stuff. remember um, Mike Allred uh, had a band and also made a movie and stuff like because he worked. He did some Oni stuff. So I remember Oni sent me some Mike Allred material when I first started working with them. And I was like listening to a CD of his and stuff. I was just like, how, how the fuck did this guy do this? Like that was, you know, and I started doing my own music and stuff. I, there was like websites that would let you like make CDs back then and stuff. And it was so janky. It was so like no one wanted it. And the, the product was terrible, you know, print on demand, like the equivalent, the CD equivalent of print on demand. So, um, I don't know, but it was it was still cool, and and like I said, even like Urasawa, like it's it's interesting to me when people are kind of multidisciplinary, even if no one ever wants to hear a song I wrote. Like it's it's still just a way of me kind of getting material out of my head. Do you feel compulsion to create? Yeah, but it's it's um, I don't know. There's some like David Mamet quote or something that's like you you know you 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 create like to to cure the like raging imbalance in your head or some some shit like that. I don't remember the exact words. I used to have it printed out somewhere. You know, I so, some days I don't want to create at all, but like I, I do feel like I have to on some level. Brian, you baffle us, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is it, yeah. Is just, I've, I've never been discipline. like I've never yeah I've never been like a draw every day guy. I've never been that. And um, when I'm working on a book, yes, it's like nonstop. Um, but when I don't have like that thing to get out, like I just, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty chill. I think I think I'm chill. Do those shelves behind you kind of mirror your influences in as much as like a healthy blend of video game carts, anime comics, like, like what's going on back there? Oh yeah. You can see, uh, I started buying Nintendo games last year during the pandemic. I put them all face out up there. Uh, you, I mean, you can't see them at all, but like, um, what are the important ones, man? You RPG guy? 
not in NES days, really. Uh, I was really into like Mega Man, and um, you know, I was I was a kid. I was Super Dodgeball and River City Ransom, like that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, the the later stuff like Final Fantasy, uh, the Super Nintendo era, Chrono Trigger, all that stuff. Uh, what else is over here? I got a I got a Coop poster over here. He used to live in Burbank here where I live and uh, moved away a couple years ago. Gave me one of those. No, I, I paid him for that shit. I paid him 150 bucks for that. <laughs> but he just had it lying around. And then, yeah, under there I got a lot of manga. Um, that's my manga shelf. You, uh, I can turn my camera, actually. You can see over here, like, um, this is, like, my main kind of graphic novels and nonfiction. You can see some, uh, some Jaime over here. You can see some Euro stuff over here. Uh, you can see my Scrooges up here. See that Calvin and Hobbes right next to it. The Calvin, yeah, chewed up by my dog. And um, I got some yearbooks over there. This shelf, the yellow one over here, you can't really see it, but that's where I have like that's where I have my kayfabe shit. <laughs> you got you guys have uh, inspired me to buy a lot of stuff the last couple of years. Names um, names, and a lot of oversized oversized books are over there. Yeah, you guys you guys make a lot of oversized books. I'll tell you that. Bigger's better, right? I love it. I've never done one, but I love it. Do you have a checklist of like uh, you know the things you want to do in future projects? Not really. I I I don't know. I I mean I I feel like we'll probably do a oversized snot girl book because Image likes to do those, and Leslie's art would really translate to that. With my art, I'm just like I'm reluctant. I don't know if I want to. I know people love my art, but I I think I still like I'm ambivalent about my own art. Um, you know, it, I've, I've always been ambivalent about doing like an art book or a sketchbook. Uh, the last few years I've filled up like a dozen sketchbooks, which I never used to. Um, but it's still like, I don't know if I want to show people that. Like to me, like that's like, that's like uh, trimming my fingernails or some shit. You know, it's just like, I got to do that. I, it's like an exercise, but I don't necessarily like what's left behind when I do it. That's interesting that you've uh, that you've started on sketchbooks recently. I'm not a very active sketchbook. Like if you look at my sketchbooks, they're much more notebooks than sketchbooks. There might be a right. little bit of drawing, but it's a lot of like written notes. Yeah, um, gives me hope. I think that after I um, after my injury, I kind of had to work on relearning to draw a little bit, like and and relearning like what I want to do with drawing. Um, and also just the ergonomics. I'm always like setting up new new setups and trying to figure out like the best way to sit and draw. You know, when I was when I was doing Scott Pilgrim, it was just like on a kitchen table, and I was like bent over, and it was it was it probably was really bad for me. That's why I hurt my shoulder years later. You know, um, but um, yeah, in terms of those sketchbooks, like the past five six years, like I just sometimes I'll just take a day and and just fill a couple of pages and just and just draw to draw practice and and i had never really like practiced drawing before other than busting out the pages you know like i i improved on the page um but it was interesting to kind of like take a break from pages and just and just kind of like doodle for a while we're talking about i do that. think i got better we we're talking about that earlier just uh how if you're working on a monthly comic or something or a 160 page comic in a year like you are practicing on the page uh, there's yeah. no there's no room left uh, unless you are like those, like, like that Chris Ware stuff when you discover that he has that weird uh, dated comic book diary that he draws. So he'll do mm. one of those ridiculous pages and then uh, instead of watch episode of Sanford and Son or something like that at the end of the day, man, he's he's doing a, a couple of panels in his little journal. Yeah, or like Seth has those books that he did entirely in his sketchbook. Uh, the Great Northern Brotherhood of Cartoonists or whatever that book is called. It's like one of my favorite Seth books, but he did it in the margins of his sketchbook. Yeah, I think Wimbledon Green uh, was a yeah, consequence yeah, yeah. of ske sketchbook work and stuff. And 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 uh, man, how much would you hate to hear from everybody how like that's that's you know their that's favorite, their favorite. Book and shit. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, like yeah, the thing yeah. that you're toiling on and doing five sets of roughs and tracing paper and light boxing and stuff. That's yeah. so funny to think about. It's just how it works. Like, uh, you know, we you have little glimpses of it online when you put something up on your Instagram or something. And, and it's maybe like a little bit dashed out, kind of kind of just, it's whatever. Like, you could tell that people might dig it or whatever, and then they like it way too much. But then the stuff yeah. that you uh, are really laboring on that, you know, like Brian Lee O'Malley might like it, Jim Rugg might like it, but like your average person who's just trying to like, 
you know, have have a little fun at the end of the day looking at their phone, they could give a fuck about how well you drew that uh, duct yeah. work or something. It's, it's painful when someone likes the rough better than the final, <laughs> you know? Even when I like it better than the final, but especially when, like, the fans like it better than the final. So I, I don't want to post my roughs, you know? It's almost I don't want that way. feeling. It's almost yeah. always that way, man. Like, like the, the artist that can really translate the energy and the roughs into the final page, like, that's, that's somebody who's really cracking a Da Vinci code. Yeah. It's not even limited just to roughs. Like, I think there are things, like, that you'll draw where it's like, man, I finally, I drew that car in perspective perfectly, and it's just invisible. Nobody pays any yeah. attention. I remember a Jim Lee interview, and he'd talk about that where it's like, you know, the Wolverine pose on the page is what everybody's excited about, but I drew this thing in the background that, you know, like I nailed this part, and nobody yeah. ever, you, you never hear about that. It's, it's, I always it's talk about this, this. I always talk about this one phone booth that I drew in Scott Pilgrim. <laughs> That's like my favorite part. In that in that uh, chasing Amy movie, the part that I remember the most is the two guys. They got their table set up like this, man. And the one dude's a pencil and one dude's an inker. And he's like, "This is a really great light pool you drew." And he's like, "Oh yeah, that's the one over across the street by the bank." And I'm like, "Man, that's comics. That's that's me when I grow up. <laughs> I'm gonna have my dude. We're gonna yeah. be talking about our light pools and our telephone booths and stuff like yeah, that." Yeah, that that's an influence that none of us probably talk about enough because that's not a very good movie. But like the fact that I got to see like this vision of cartoonists working in this cool studio, like that was huge for me because I was I was like. When did that come out? Maybe 97. So I'm like, you know, in, in my late teens, I graduated high school that year. So yeah, that was huge for me. Just seeing that vision. He really captured a little bit of that indie comic spirit too, man, at those panel discussions. <laughs> oh yeah. The, the cons. Yeah. I hadn't even been to a big con at that point, but yeah, he nailed everything. Shouts to Hart D. Fisher, man, with his Marvel can suck cock shirts uh, floating around <laughs> on, on, on the, the convention floor in the movie. Makes me want to watch that again now. It is funny, though, like anybody that was making comics, you know that we watched that movie completely differently than other people that would go to that movie. Screw your love story All shit, All we man. care about are like the details I'm, in the background. I'm looking in yeah. the studio, and I'm seeing that Matt Wagner painting for that one Grendel cover, man, with the brick walls behind him on a, that's, that's on a brick wall. <laughs> I'm looking at yeah, and that that was like that was like the next thing after like the Rob Liefeld videos and shit like just seeing how cartoonists work like that was so rare back then even if it was fake in the movie you know such science fiction because the the joint that they had as a studio was like in a proper like downtown city like walk up kind of joint man it's like four thousand dollar a month rent it was like a loft yeah maybe not back in the nineties though I don't know maybe they could have gotten away with it. <laughs> It'd be a funny, a funny movie to watch with like cartoonist commentary. We'll, on top we'll, we'll of. do the cartoonist cafe body of commentary track <laughs> yeah. on top of that. Like all the main story stuff, which is just completely just unacknowledged. Blah blah yeah. blah. Yeah, you're a lesbian. <laughs> blah, fast blah, forward, blah, blah. fast forwarding to the next comics drawing yeah. scene. That's funny. You know, the other thing I, I think that uh, people encounter whenever they start making and publishing work and putting it out there is that what people respond to is different, and you sort of have to. I don't know, like somehow adjust to the idea yeah. of like, I knew I drew this hand bad, but I just had to finish it. You have to kind of adjust that people don't care or they skip that part or they like the parts that you're not sure of. And it's, I used to see that all the time at conventions when I would start, when someone would come up to a table, compliment the person, and then that person would sort of harshly reject that compliment. Same era, <laughs> you know, it's that 2004 era, SPX, it's the, it's the consequence of uh, of the Dan Clowes and Charles Burns and the Chris Wares, uh, Chris Ware especially is being and and Seth actually like who'd be very self-effacing in interviews and the culture of those festivals was like if these guys can't make peace with their own work, well I certainly can't. But the thing is like the indie guy is like cosplaying and doing his version of right. Chris Ware and it just came off like goofy. It was it was a shtick. It was definitely poor um, salesmanship. Yeah. 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 But I mean, yeah, when I, whenever I think back to those days, just sitting behind that table at the flea market is what it felt like. Oh, totally. No, totally. no one wants to buy my shit. Um, you know, that's that's never a great feeling. It is and that funky space. Sitting, sitting there all day. Yeah, it is that funky space, too, that you would have been in, man, because we, like, we kind of are the generation that could like bridge the gap of, like, you know, fight comics, mainstream comics, and, and indie. But, like, the culture of that spx it was they use that term navel gazing at the yeah. time where it was like a lot of na it was navel gaze comics and to have I, re I remember every now and then there would be a person who must have been local who read that a comic-con is going to be in town 
and a dude would show up in cosplay and shit and just be like, what is all this hipster bullshit? Like, I want to circle back to the, what you were saying about the bad drawings and like, and kind of just, you know, every book I did was like on a deadline and, and there's plenty of bad drawings, but like having a really popular comic for 18 years, like I've seen every, every single bad drawing has been like highlighted by someone on the internet, like either to make fun of me or, <laughs> Or like it's their favorite panel, you know, it's like, <laughs> so you never know. I've just, I've seen it all at this point with my own work. Like I, I can't even judge my own work anymore because I've, I've just seen every reaction to it with social media. That's Our, a strange phenomena. It's funny to think of like, it's almost worse if it's the drawing you think is bad and somebody's like, <laughs> this is my favorite drawing. <laughs> right. Just, just bolsters that whole idea of like, once it's out of your hands, like you got to wash your hands of it. Keep, yeah. keep moving yeah. forward. Don't even look at the peanut gallery because, like, what, what's what's a best-case scenario there? You know, you get your ego stroked. Like, what is that? Who cares, man? Yeah, man. It that, belongs to the world now. That ain't paying the bills. Brian, you, um, you know, like, like having your experience with Scott Pilgrim, the movie, talking about multidisciplinary, uh, you know, artists, have you uh, thought about working, doing... Um, writing films doing any more work in film or um or video games have you have you done any work in those directions it's kind of funny because i moved here uh to la like right when the movie was coming out and um and the movie you know they sent i remember they sent me this letter that was like this is gonna be a four quadrant hit like it's gonna be a huge movie and then the movie comes out and it's like bottom of the chart and like disappears after two weeks um so a lot of the stuff that I kind of like that maybe would have happened, like just didn't happen because of that. Like, it was just like your persona non grata when your movie tanks, like, and that was like a famous, there was like two famous bombs that year. It was my movie. And there was that, um, John Carter of Mars movie that also bombed. It, no one fucking cares 10 years later, but, um, you know, I took a few meetings. I like went around talking about cartoons and stuff for a little while. Cause that's just what people told me I should do. And I, I hated it. I hated being in meetings. I hated going to studios, talking to execs who don't care who I am or anything. Or they'll say they do, but I don't believe a single word they say. And um, and then even when they started buttering me up and saying, like, this could happen, like, I don't want to spend seven years of my life on some cartoon. Like, that's just not, that's not what I want. I want to draw comics. I don't really care about cartoons. That said, I am working on something in the animation world, which is exciting to me. Um, but it's still really early days, so I don't, I don't, I don't know how it's going to go yet. Um, but other than that, like, no, no, I haven't really done much in Hollywood. Everybody says that, uh, you go out, go out to Glittertown, like Burbank is the spot to be, to find like other, other real heads, you know, it's, it's where a lot of the animation studios are out there. So you're going to find other like drawers who, who are authentic people, like as a cartoonist, sensitive kind of soul sitting around making comics all day like you don't have the right mentality i just imagine that town could chew you up and spit you out so have you uh as you establish roots there it's been however many you know teens of years uh you got a good circle of of people other uh cartoonists any any stuff like that out there some sort of not really to be honest to be honest i'm a fucking hermit um i do know people i mean especially during the pandemic i've barely seen anyone like you guys started hanging out early in the pandemic and I was like I was like is this okay <laughs> I was just like watching your videos like week three of the pandemic and then I was like no this is okay and I'm glad you guys have been doing it but yeah I I haven't um I've barely seen anyone uh, and like I said um I used to know Coop this fellow right here he moved away like right when I moved to Burbank but um he's like 10 years older than me and you know, I lived in LA, so I, I like had Thanksgiving dinner with him and his wife a couple of times. And, um, uh, he was kind of like a, a little bit of a, of a mentor in that. I don't know. In I, I don't know in what way we were, we had like nothing in common, like artistically, but, um, we got along real well. Um, he moved to Austin. I haven't seen him in a couple of years. Um, and then a lot of people, like people, our generation, they all got jobs at Cartoon Network and shit like that. And and then that becomes its own culture. And I feel really uh, like on the outside of that. So I don't like go hang out with all these people who are now animation people who used to be indie comics people. But now in my mind, there's something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't do your um your your test your test boards for to join the Adventure Time team. 
Yeah, I just I just was c- kind of completely unaware of that because it all kind of happened in the wake of my movie and stuff, and I was just I was in my own head and um, trying to do my own thing, and, and then all all of a sudden, like all of these kind of like SPX types got snapped up because they got healthcare and stuff, you know, and it's good for them, but um, bad for comics. It bad for comics for sure. Yeah, yeah. We we yeah. lost a generation of incredible comics. We lo- we lost a generation. Yeah, I say it all the time. Yeah, totally, man. I uh, think about that pandemic when it started. Uh, just to break kayfabe, I don't think I felt one sense of fear, like a, a percentage point of fear, like hanging out with Jim, because we're just hermits ourselves. Like, uh, yeah. I feel like you were the only dude I saw for about six months, one yeah. time a week. You know, I, I do sympathize with people that didn't have that because it was once a week I could leave the house. Uh, yeah. And I, I would have gone nuts if I didn't have some sort of, you know, some release somewhere. I don't know. I'm sure I'm sure I speak for a lot of cartoonists. when It's, it's been it's been cool having hours and hours of you guys bullshitting <laughs> uh, just on on deck, you know. It's yeah, nice to have. It's symbiotic for sure, man, because just hanging out and making this stuff is like the little oasis in the week. Jimmy, do you have any other big big uh, points to hit, man? No, because... I think that's uh, I think that's it. Brian, what what are you uh, working on? Do you want to promote anything, social media, any of that sort of stuff? Uh, now's the time. We'll include links in the description also. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm working on a bunch of stuff that is not really coming to fruition yet. Um, I didn't I didn't release anything in the year of 2021, so. Um, but that's okay. It's not all about how many pages you put out per year. Um, maybe, uh, you know, like I said, I'm working on an animation thing. I'm writing Snot Girl. Uh, I'm, I'm still working on my graphic novel and hopefully all that stuff will see the light of day soon. Um, I mostly am on Instagram. I'm trying to be on it less, but, uh, Radio Maru is where you'll find me on there. Super cool, man. We'll include those links in the description below. Thanks so much for joining us today, Brian. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Long yeah. time Thanks, coming. boys. Thanks, Brian. Hey, oh, yeah. favors. Like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What is out there, Jimmy? Hulk Grand Design. Tell your local comic shop to pre-order that thing right now. Want to get those numbers through the roof. Show Marvel what the kayfabe effect is all about. So if you plan on buying Hulk Grand Design on 316, let your comic shop know immediately to uh, pre-order a copy for you. And you can join me on patreon.com slash jimrug to see some behind the scenes on how I put Hulk Grand Design together. Red Room, the anti-social network, is out on the stands right now. Get your hands on it. Uh, That is the precursor for Red Room Trigger Warnings, which is going to be coming out March 9th. Uh, March 2022 is the the month of kayfabe in the comic book uh, stores, Ben. Uh, Trigger Warnings, issue number one, is going to be coming out uh, March 9th. Every issue of that will be self-contained. That complete story is on my Patreon right now at this moment. I put up new strips every Tuesday. You can get to links to all of our stuff in uh, our link trees in the description below this video. What else do we have out there, Jimmy? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Given those Martian orders, we're going to be on our way. Read more comics.